Today's video was recorded on November 15th, 2022. In this week's lesson, we're going to explore the parable of the ten virgins, or sometimes known as the parable of the ten bridesmaids, which is found in Matthew chapter 25. Now this parable is told as Jesus is making his final arrival into Jerusalem, and he's directing it at the religious leaders that are there in Jerusalem and at the temple. The parable of the ten bridesmaids is about redemption. And what's unique is that the parable reflects the story of Exodus and the common interpretations of Exodus found in the first century. So I wanted to use this parable as a way to summarize our study of Exodus, but also just because it's always fun to look closely at Jesus' parables as they're not always easy to understand. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine the many symbols that Jesus uses, like the lamp, the oil, the fact that it's midnight or that they fell asleep, and we're going to see how those symbols carry his intended critique of the religious leaders. And really what's amazing about this parable is we can also apply the message to our own lives. What does it mean for us to be able to shine God's light into the darkness of the world? Now, as we approach the final weeks of 2022, we ask that you would consider including Fig Tree Ministries in your year-end giving. And Fig Tree Ministries is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're supported by the amazing generosity of our donors. So your financial support would directly impact our ability to expand our reach and help others just like you go deeper into the biblical text. Support for our ministry is easy and secure. You can find a donate link at our website, figtreeteaching.com, and we've also included that link that will take you directly to the donation page in the show notes below. For all of our supporters, we give a big Hazak Hazak Venitezek, which translates be strong, be strong, and together we'll be strengthened. We thank you again for all of your fantastic support throughout 2022, and we hope you enjoy this lesson today on the book of Exodus and the parable of the ten virgins. So what I thought I would do, I had been debating how to wrap up Exodus. And so I thought I'd try to do something rather unique by connecting Exodus with a parable that, that Jesus tells. The parable of the ten bridesmaids. Some, some Bibles say that the ten virgins, but they're there as bridesmaids. And what I hope to show you is how it connects to Exodus. So it's like Jesus is looking at Exodus, telling a story in his current day, applying it to the current day. But then it's pulling in all the history of Exodus as a story of redemption. So God willing, I think you'll see that tonight. But I thought it would be a fun way to kind of wrap things up. I know everyone always likes it when you can do a, when you can connect it with Jesus. And then two, parables are always fun because they're not always easy to understand what they're talking about. So, okay, this photo, this painting, photo, this painting, really, Hieronymus Franken, the second, that is, uh, his in 1616, it's called The Parable of the Wise and Foolish Virgins. Now, this painting, though, what he did was he added a moral component. All of the ladies on the left, they're either drinking wine, playing piano, sleeping, have an instrument. All the ladies in the right, they're praying, they have their candles lit. Kind of moralized the, the painting, but anyways. So that is the... Wise and Foolish Virgins. This will be Exodus Study Part 29, as I mentioned. So, the first thing we want to do, if you would, is turn to Matthew. We're going to read the whole parable, and then we'll talk about the components, and as we talk about them, we'll, we'll move back to Exodus and show how they're connected, either connected directly to Exodus or connected to the interpretations that the rabbis had about Exodus. So either one, because, well, let me show you a little. All right, so here's where we're going to be, Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Now, I didn't put this on your handout, but all you have to do is note one thing, okay? As we uh, look at a timeline, 
So if we go from left to right, we have a timeline. Jesus is teaching here somewhere around 33 AD. And of course, he's got then this parable is going to be looking through the lens of history, not only history, but interpretation of their sacred text. So Exodus is way back here, somewhere around 1300 BC, depending on how you want to date the Exodus. And then, of course, the Exodus is, Exodus is the central story of Israel, and it's the central story of Jesus and the New Testament which is why it's such an important book for us to, uh, to study. If we go forward in the Old Testament, you get a writing that's called the Song of Solomon. And so now you think, well, what does the Song of Solomon have to do with the Exodus? Well, the rabbis interpret the Song of Solomon as an allegory of the courtship and the wedding between God and Israel. So between the Song of Solomon as a, as a written text, in Jesus' day, you've got now an interpretation as an allegory. Now, for those of you who've ever gone to, or if you've celebrated a Passover event with a Jewish synagogue, the custom is you read the Song of Solomon during a Passover. Why? Because it's God going to get his beloved and bringing his beloved into the bridal chamber, as we'll see today. They see that as a big allegory of God's love for Israel. And so that's read on Passover. So you can see what Jesus is doing is he's looking not only through the interpretation, but all the way back to the book of Exodus. And he's going to connect these, this parable. The, the people he's telling the parable to, they get it. They know he's talking Exodus stuff, and he, they know he's directing it at them. Now, just to give you one scholar, now she passed away in 2002, but she was a professor at Notre Dame, Josephine Massingbird Ford. So it's M-A-S-S-I-N-G-B-E-R-D, and then hyphenated Ford, Josephine Massingbird Ford. So she's written about this as well as some other scholars about how, the, how these are connected. But the point is, is the parable, parable of the Ten Bridesmaids is going to be connected to Exodus. And God willing, we'll see that that will come through clearly. Okay, so let's start. We're going to read the parable. Now, if you look at your sheet, the handout that I gave you, I've got one through 10 of different items that, you know, we have to remember when Jesus is telling a parable, he is in command of all the details of the story. And every detail that he puts in or every detail he leaves out, there's a reason. And so if there's a lamp and oil, you got to look at both and say, why is he doing that? If it says midnight, if it's, you know, whatever it is, he's got, he's got something in there. There's a reason he's putting in that detail. And then those details, how would that first century audience interpret those details? That's the hard part, is to dig into how they would see all of these details. So if you're following along one through 10, I'll comment as we read about the meaning or what the meaning would be behind his usage here. So verse one, he starts out, this, the parable starts out. Now there's, Jesus tells a number of parables about the kingdom of heaven. And one of the things that should, our alarm bell should go off is that the kingdom of heaven, when we talk about heaven or God's reign here on earth, it's not, a, it, it's not an easy topic for us to understand. So he tells like six or seven parables, and they're all giving you little aspects of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew. Okay, so verse one, he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So in this case, the kingdom of heaven is going to be just like uh, in Revelation, when, God, when, the, when the new Jerusalem comes down, when there's the, final, the fullness of redemption is happening. It's Revelation 21, right? The new heavens and the new earth come down. God's presence is back with his people. So it's, a, it's an idea of redemption. It's the fullness of redemption. You could say it's the messianic age, when God and his presence and his people are back together. 
So it's the fullness of redemption. And just as we've seen in Exodus, what the books of what the book of Exodus shows us is in Exodus 40, that final chapter is the fullness of redemption. It's when God's presence is residing with his people. That's the same definition. That's the same definition that goes throughout the whole Bible. So the kingdom of heaven, what's it going to be like? Ten virgins. Now you'd have all kinds of questions. Who are the who are the bridesmaids? Why is he picking the number ten? Right? And there can be all kinds of reasons, like the Ten Commandments, ten. Ten people that need to get together in order to have a Bible study in the first century. That's how that went. So you have ten virgins, and they took their lamps. All right, and we'll talk tonight about why they took lamps. What does lamps represent? And then they went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, who's the bridegroom? In this case, as Jesus is telling it, in Israel's mind, the bridegroom is God, or if we're if we're pointing this forward as like the church, we have the, the bride who descends down with the church, so it's the Messiah, the Christ. So either one, it doesn't matter. But in their mind, the bride is God. Why? Because they're first century Jews, and that's how they think. Okay, let me think here. Now, one question is that I put this on your sheet, where's the bride? So. Jesus leaves the bride out of the parable. What would be interesting is to say, well, why then? Why are the ten bridesmaids attending to the bridegroom? That's not their job. Their, their job is to attend to the bride. But they're going out to meet the bridegroom. Now, the bride, by the way, of course, we know that from Exodus, is Israel. So one thing we're going we're gonna to ask later is, those ten bridesmaids, who attends to Israel? Who is he talking to? Who, who are they going to understand that that's directed at? So, okay, then the next sentence, verse 2. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. So we get number five, we get number five, there's a ten. We know ten has all kinds of associations. Verse 3. For the foolish, when they took their lamps, they took no oil with them. So immediately we have to say, what does Jesus mean by lamps? What's he talking about? And what does he mean by no oil? What's the significance of the oil? What does that oil represent? Because as we'll look at it in a minute, a lamp, the lamp by itself, doesn't create light. It needs the oil. The oil is inside the lamp. That's how the light is created. So there's something about the difference between lamp and the difference between the oil that the oil is needed then for the light to shine out of that lamp, to shine into the darkness. Okay, verse 4. But the wise took their oil in their vessels with their lamps. So again, he repeats. You've got oil there, and they've got their lamps. Let's go to the next verse, verse 5. Now, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So, why is the bridegroom delayed? What's going on here? And we'll see in a little bit, um, when we talk about a Jewish wedding, there's a one-year delay. This is, I'll, I'll explain how Jewish weddings go, but there's usually a year in between the time that you, that you select the marriage partner and they agree, and then the finalization of the wedding. This is this is like Mary and Joseph, right? They're engaged, which in that culture essentially means you're married, but you're not living together as husband and wife, and they should not have consummated the, the marriage, which is the scandal that she's pregnant. So it doesn't happen until a year later. So you have to wait, and you don't know when the bridegroom is going to come get the bride. But then it says, and they slumbered and slept. So they couldn't stay awake. We'll look at that in a minute with, uh, with Exodus, because there's something about Exodus that shows up about slumbering and sleeping. Then, verse 6, but at midnight there was a cry. What's going on at midnight? Midnight is a special time for God to move, particularly in the book of Exodus. So there's a cry out, look, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. 
Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. So they got up, they trimmed their lamps. Then it says, The foolish ones, now because they don't have any oil, say to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Now this is going to be an interesting point. When, you, when we look at what the oil is, they can't share the oil. They say, give us some of your oil. And the wise answered saying, no, we can't do that. There won't be enough. Go, go and to those who sell the oil and buy for yourself. Okay? And then we finish verse 10. So while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgin, virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Now that's the parable. It ends right there at verse 12. Now what Jesus does here in Hebrew is called a nimshal. The nimshal is the explanation of the parable. So verse 13, he says, Therefore, watch, for you do not know the day or the hour. So that when he tells them, you got to watch. You got to stay awake. Uh, that's the explanation of the parable. But there's so much detail, so much, um, so many details going on, particularly for that first century audience. So, okay, that's the parable. And then we have all these little details that we have to figure out. So I want to go back. This is now number two on your handout. And just talk about what did we learn about Exodus? What did we learn through this series about how they view the book of Exodus? And one of the main things that I had said uh, multiple times is that Exodus is viewed as a wedding between God and Israel. So God pulls his people out to Mount Sinai. There's a covenant relationship happening, just like a marriage covenant. And of course, this is the same as the New Testament, right? The writers of our New Testament being Jewish, they're simply using the same metaphor. Now they're extending that marriage-like covenant relationship to Jesus. Okay? So, there's a wedding that's happening. First, go to Mount Sinai, but that's the first step. Then, now, there's going to be a period of time before you consummate the wedding, right? And so, the consummation of Exodus, the consummation of the marriage, is Exodus 40. That's when you get to the end, and God's presence is now dwelling intimately. You know, when Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near, that word has come near is the intimacy of a, of a husband and wife. That's where, how God wants to dwell with us. So it fits their metaphor of, uh, of a marriage. So we have a wedding. It's consummated at the end. And what hinders the consummation of the wedding, right, is the golden calf. Israel has to keep the covenant. We spent weeks on that, the, that chiastic structure where until Israel followed the covenant, you can't be fully married, right? And it's just like any marriage that says, hey, I, can I go do whatever I want in this marriage, even though we're in a covenant? And the answer, of course, is no, you cannot. So it's each, per, each side has responsibilities in that covenant relationship. So that's what we learned about Exodus. Now, something that we learned, and this is number three on your handout, we learned this way back in week 11. It was this, the lesson that we did on the Passover is the whole book of Exodus is about redemption, and that redemption then is set in the metaphor of a wedding. And in the book of Exodus, there are four expressions of redemption. And these expressions become central to a Passover celebration. And, by the way, the Last Supper that Jesus had, right? See, th these expressions become the cups of wine that you eat or that you drink at a Passover meal. And what's important for Christians to know what these cups are and what they represent is because then you can look at the Last Supper and see which cup Jesus is making comments about. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So, the four expressions of redemption. Now, if you, if you want, you can turn to... Exodus 6, 6 and 7. If not, um, you can just listen to it and you'll see. Uh, we'll go over them. I've got them on your handout there. But this is when God is telling Moses, I'm going to bring you out of 
uh, this uh, underneath the yoke of slavery. Okay, so God says He's saying this to Moses. Therefore, say to the Israelites, "I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians." The first one, I'll bring you out. That's the first expression. Then he says, I will free you from being slaves to them. So free you, that's the second one. Third, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. So I will redeem you, that's a third one. And they're all kind of in the same ballpark of what God is up to, but I'll show you in a minute. There's uniqueness to each, each expression. Then he finally says, I'll take you as my own people and I will be your God. I will take you. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from underneath the yoke of the Egyptians. So you have, I'll bring you out, I'll free you, I'll redeem you, and I'll take you in that order. And again, this becomes the central theme in a Passover meal. And so if we go closer and we look at those, and this is what's on your handout, I'll bring you out. And they're each distinct words, yatsa, I'll rescue you, not Saul. In the rescue, eh, there's no sense of uh, relationship happening. It's just, I'll rescue you. Then you get to the next one. I'll redeem you, ga'al. Now this one is familial. This has to do with the father's house. And this is a cultural expression. You find yourself outside the Father's house, maybe because of your own sin, maybe because of a strong enemy, whatever. And the Father sends a representative to go get you and redeem you back in, and you're redeemed back into the Father's house. What does Jesus tell us he's going to do? I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. I can't, Jesus is the Redeemer. This is the third cup of wine. When he says, this wine represents my blood, it's the, it's the cup of redemption. Jesus is the Redeemer that the Father sent to bring us home. Praise God for doing that. Then finally, the last one, I'll take you. Lakak. And this one is a marriage. And so you can see what's happening is there's increasingly, from the bottom to the top, they get more intimate. So it's like there's little bitty stages of redemption as God pulls us out and then rescues us here and then re redeems us back into the household and then eventually says, we're going to have a marriage. And that's, that's the book of Revelation. It's that the bridegroom and the church that are finally coming together, right? So we're, we're Jesus is preparing a place for the Father's house. That's step one. That's what you do. That's, a, that's wedding language. And then, by the way, then we're going to have the marriage, the marriage of the church and the Lamb. So, I think you can see it's so rich in its imagery, but of course we can often miss that when we're just reading the English and we don't quite get the nuances of the Hebrew. Um, so, you have a book about redemption. It's set in the context of a wedding. The whole thing moves forward to the New Testament, same language in the New Testament. Okay, now turn, if, if you would, turn your sheet over, and now I want to look at, deal with some of the symbolism that's going to then, again, connect us back to Exodus, but through the symbolism. So the first one is the lamp. As soon as you see that, you have to say, why is Jesus putting a lamp in there? What's the big deal with the lamp? Well, first of all, that's how you, right? We have, we have street lights and power and electricity in our houses and things like that. This is, uh, here's a picture. Let me show you a picture. This is a group of ancient oil lamps. So many of you have seen these. If you've traveled or you know, you know what one is just from studying your Bible, they hold the oil. There's one end where the flame will come out. And you could see as artisans are making their, their uh, oil lamps, they want to make them look cool like everything so people will buy them. But uh, that's a group. All, those are all Greco from the Greek or Roman period. So that's the oil lamp. Okay. So what does the oil lamp represent? What's the lamp? Well, to the first century mind, the lamp is the Torah, the Bible. 
It's God's Word. Why? Where do they get that? Well, the Bible tells us. This is Psalm 19, 105. Your Word is a lamp for my feet. Isn't that how we walk with God? Part of the reason that we study our Bible is to become more familiar with God's Word. And it's that Word, as we're acting out life here every day, not knowing what the future is, we rely on the Word of God for the wisdom, the principles that are going to help us walk in the world so that our feet don't stumble. That's the picture. So you have a lamp. That's the Torah or the Bible. You say, okay, then, then why does Jesus talk about oil? What's the point of the oil? Why does he separate oil and lamp? Well, look, let's go back to the lamps for a minute. So if we go back to this picture, do the lamps produce light by themselves? The lamp is empty, right? The lamp has nothing in it that produces light. No, you need to put something in so the light will then emanate out into the darkness of the world. And so the oil inside the lamp, that becomes the illuminating power. Okay, so the oil then is the way they think about it. It's the faithful obedience to the Bible, right? The Bible is like a book of potential. It just sits there. Itself doesn't shine the light. But when we internalize it, it enlightens our walk. And then when we obey God, when we go out into the world and be the hands and feet of Jesus, we bring light to the world. So it's the faithful obedience to the Bible that creates the light. That's the oil inside of that oil lamp. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not about salvation. It's just like, you know, the Israelites at Mount, at Mount Sinai. God already saved them. Now you're in that covenant relationship. It says, okay, you have responsibilities in relation to this covenant, so now go out into the world and manifest goodness, right? How is our light, how is God's light going to shine into the world? It's by you. And so it's our actions. So don't lie, don't cheat, tell the truth in matters of justice, have mercy on those who are, you know, worse off than you at this, at any given moment. Forgive each other. Now that's actually work, isn't it? Forgiveness brings light into the world, but you have to do it, right? What good is a commandment to love your neighbor if you don't do it? It's like God never said it. So it's our actions in the world that produce light. It's the action part. You know, that great commandment that we've, we looked at, what good is the commandment in Exodus that says, help your enemy when his donkey falls over, the whole point, so you can come together with your enemy in common humanity. But what's the point of the commandment if you don't do it? So the commandment itself doesn't create the light you do. We're set apart in the world, right? We abstain from some things, we engage in other actions. And that's, that's what increases the light in the world. Now, to show you an example of rabbinic thinking about this, not only the lamp, but the oil, I gave, this is on your sheet. It's a big, long paragraph, and it comes from a writing called Exodus Rabbah. So notice it's connected to the book of Exodus. And this is a rabbinic writing about the light and the lamp. Okay? So I'm just going to read it. You can probably, you're probably better off just reading it right off the sheet or just listening, but it's all about the light. Okay, so here's what it says, starting off at the top. It says, but those who study the Torah give forth light wherever they may be. So they equate, look, just studying the Bible produces light into the world. And then they use type like a, a parable It's because like, uh, they use the word like. It's like one standing in the dark with a lamp in his hand. When he sees a stone, he does not stumble, neither does he fall over a gutter. As it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Of course, they're quoting Psalm 119. Then they ask a question. What is the lamp of God? The Torah. The Bible. As it says, for the commandment, 
is a lamp, and the teaching is light. That's Proverbs. Now, see what they're doing. They're connecting all these verses that are going to help us understand the, the association between lamp and light. Then it says, why is the commandment a lamp? Because if one performs a commandment, now we're getting into action, right? When you perform the commandment, it's as if he kindled a light before God and as if he revived his own soul. And oh, by the way, the soul is also called a light. For it says, the spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord. Now, you can see what they're doing. They're taking it all the way from, from the Torah is the lamp to now the soul of a human being is God's lamp into the world. How does God uh, shine his light into the world? Through you. We're supposed to be the light on the hill to go shine into the world. And so how do we do that? It's when we enact the good news into the world. That shines our light out into the darkness. Now, by the way, what's really cool, what, what the rabbis are doing here is something they call it stringing pearls. They're stringing together little pearls, a, a, a verse here, a verse there, a verse here, and they string them all together and they make something that's very unique, that, something that helps us understand something about God or our actions with God or how we walk in the world. And Paul does the same thing. If, you know, if he's in Romans or in you know, one of his writings, he'll string together like four or five different verses from the Old Testament that seem rather confusing to us. That's what he's doing. He's weaving together verses to say, here's who Jesus is. So, okay, you can see from the, uh, from the, the, story, the parable that Jesus is telling, the lamp is the Torah. The oil is the faithful obedience to the Torah. And somebody was, doesn't have any oil. Which means what? Hey, I've got the Torah, but I'm not implementing it. That's what Jesus is upset about. And watch out if you're not. Because when final redemption comes, the door may be closed, is what he's saying to those priests and those Pharisees. So, okay, that's lamp and oil. It's very unique. And you can, you can see how the rabbis are doing exactly the same thing that Jesus did. It actually helps helps us understand the parable. Okay, uh, number six, why does he say they were drowsy or they slept? He's not necessarily upset that they fell asleep. It's not, doesn't, it's not like he's chastising them for falling asleep. He's really upset about the oil. But why does he mention that they fell asleep? Well, there's a tradition. comes out of the book of Exodus. And, and I put this on your handout. It's another, comes from a a writing called Pirkei de Rabbi Eleazar, and it's an anthology of rabbinic teachings. So this is, it's a later writing, but the teachings in it stretch back uh, quite far. So this is also on your sheet, and you can read along as I put it here on the screen. So Rabbi Hananiah, he says, but I love this because this is now connecting it directly to, to Exodus. And Moses went forth and came to the camp of the Israelites, and he aroused the Israelites from their sleep. So they, had, they were at Mount Sinai, and the Israelites fell asleep. And Moses goes to the camp, and he arouses the Israelites from their sleep, and he says, Arise from your sleep, for behold, the bridegroom has already come. Now, does that sound like what Jesus is saying, right? Jesus says, About midnight, there was a cry rang out. Here comes the bridegroom. And that's going right back to that idea of what of Moses having to wake up the Israelites. Here comes the bridegroom. Wake up! So it says, The bridegroom has already come, and he wishes to lead the bride and to enter into the bridal chamber to give, you the, to give the Torah to you. And the Holy One, blessed be he, also went forth to meet them like a bridegroom who goes forth to meet the bride. So the Holy One, blessed be he, he went forth and he gave them the Torah. So that the idea, as soon as they hear they fell asleep, they know exactly what he's referring to. Their traditions about Moses having to arouse the people. Now, what does that mean that they're, that they're drowsy, that they fell asleep? Well, Israel and humanity, Israel is representing humanity at that point. Humanity is asleep. 
We're all asleep and we have to be woken up. Something wakes up the people to recognize that the bridegroom, the Christ, has arrived. And I think what Jesus is doing in this, he's so much of him coming into Jerusalem, he uses the words of God's visitation. He uses the words of God's arrival to the people. So he's telling them, I'm here, wake up. But at the same time, he's looking forward to that second coming, the messianic age, when it's the, when it's the, the fulfillment of the redemption. So he's doing both things, and they know exactly. They get it. I mean, it even says in there, they knew he was telling these parables against them. So they're not dumb. Okay, so th there's the part about being drowsy or asleep. Now, next on your sheet, I know these all are a little bit disconnected, but Hopefully you can see how they're pointing back a first century wedding. And I actually should have written a first century engagement and wedding. So in the first century, you would have an engagement or a betrothal. And you would have the contract. That, that would be the Ten Commandments. Here's the contract. Here's the covenant that we're going to fulfill. And then the man and the, and the woman would, or a young man and young woman, would sit across from each other with a glass of wine. And they would sip the wine as a symbol of saying, I agree, I take on this covenant. That's part of that Passover meal with Jesus, the new covenant. If you sip that wine, you're entering into an engagement with your future bride. It's very rich metaphor. So there's an engagement. There's a period of time before the second, the actual wedding, and this is where you're going to consummate the wedding or the consummate the marriage. And so again, I mentioned that this is Joseph and Mary, right? Matthew tells us that his mother was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, in, the, in that first century, the moment you say yes at the engagement, you're married. Well, t where today we think, well, it's an engagement period, and then eventually they'll get them. You know, we do it a little bit different. But to them, the moment you say yes in that engagement, you're married legally. Now, how long is the period of time? One year. Traditionally, one year. What's going on during that one year? Well, you need to prepare a place for the groom and the bride to dwell together. And what's happening in Exodus? That's the whole last 15 chapters. Preparing a tabernacle where God's presence can dwell with the people. So God's going to dwell, and it's, that's what Jesus says. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's the room we're going to live, or the mansion, or whatever you want, whatever, however you visualize heaven to be. So it's a one-year period of time. Now you think, Okay, so what? Well, what's the Exodus timeline? What's the timeline of Exodus? From the time that Moses, or I'm sorry, from the time of the Passover to the time that God's presence dwells with his people. It's the amount of time? It's one year. It's the exact time, right? So if we look at um, Exodus 40, 17, we did this a couple weeks ago. In Exodus 40, it says, it happened in the first month in the second year. So the very beginning of that second year, God pulls them out of, at the Passover, takes them to Mount Sinai, gives them the marriage contract. Then you go the, the full year later. It happened in the first month of the second year on the first day of the month. So here we have first month, second year, first day of the month. And that's when the tabernacle is set up. And as soon as Moses sets up that tabernacle, boom, God's presence. So just like a wedding. And you can see why they view this, the book of Exodus as a wedding. And why Jesus tells a parable about weddings, because it fits their conception of their relationship with God. So there's, the, there's your one-year business. Why is there a delay? What's the timeline of Exodus? Okay, now finally, number nine. Who are the bridesmaids? So in this parable, if the bride is Israel, 
Who attends to Israel? Now, in the fuller context of Exodus 24 and 25, it's the religious leaders. When Jesus rolls into Jerusalem, all of his anger or confrontation that he's going to have is with the religious leaders. All of the parables are with the religious, and the religious leaders know it. So what's the point? He's telling them, look, you have God's word, but you're not following it. You're not. He doesn't criticize their teaching. He criticizes their action, right? You're a priest, but you're enriching yourself. You're oppressing the people for your own benefit. You're given great responsibility by God, and you're using it for your own power. You Pharisees are creating rules that are becoming a tremendous burden for the people. Stop doing that. So you've got the Bible. You might even be teaching it. Jesus doesn't necessarily criticize that, but you're not helping the poor. You're not doing the things that you should be doing to bring people in to God's fold. If you go to the end of, of chapter 25, it's the, it's the part where Jesus separates the sheep from the goat. And one really important piece to that is the sheep and the goat travel in the same flock. They have the same shepherd. So now he's going to say, the sheep were the one who fed me when I was hungry, clothed me when I was naked, visited me in jail, uh, you know, visited me when I was sick. And the, and the, the ones that, that, that go to my left, the, the goats, you are the ones who didn't feed me, who didn't show, uh, give me clothing, who didn't visit me when I was sick. It's all about their actions. So showing up in the world that, that produces the light. Okay, those are all of the... Um, the only one we didn't cover specifically was Midnight, but you, I, I put the reference there in, mid, in, um, in the book of Exodus. You can go read that. That's when God is going to show up. And that night, when, when Jesus says you need to watch, it's because it's the Passover season. And in Exodus, it says that God set up a vigil. He watched all night over the Israelites. And then it says, so from now on, you should be watching. And so you get this image of watching out on these nights, and especially around midnight. Okay, so just as a quick review, as, and I'm just, this is a quick review for the book of Exodus, but it's all about redemption. And it's redemption in multiple steps as God is bringing us out. Now, in the fullness of redemption that, that Exodus shows us is that uh, Exodus 40, and that's the, the consummation of a marriage. And so you get the marriage imagery there as God... Uh, dwells with his people. And of course, God is the bridegroom, Israel is the bride. And when will the bridegroom come? We don't know. And so the whole point is, remain awake, be vigilant, watch out for the bridegroom. And of course, that fits. It fits the culture of weddings. Uh, it fix. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the the bridegroom, to come back and get his bride. And when's he coming? We don't know. So you got you to gotta stay alert. Can't fall asleep. And make sure you have oil, right? Make sure we're out there right now bringing God's light into the world through our service, through talking to people about Jesus, through whatever it is, engaging the world wherever we can. And that brings God's light we're not perfect to be able to bring up the light in the world, but every little action that we have increases the light, and we need increased light in our world today. All right, so hopefully you can see. I mean, it's, it's a, he's got a complex parable going on, pointing there at the religious leaders, but you have to understand it goes all the way back to Exodus and that whole imagery of, of the wedding and the redemption of Israel, and they're all, you know, in his day, they were looking for the redemption of Israel just like we are today. <laughs>